for the primary tool that we use as hurricane specialists to uh, determine the intensity of tropical cyclones is the Dvorak technique. Um, this technique has been around since the 1970s and it has stood the test of time. Um, there has been nothing which has de been developed since then which has taken its place and I think that's notable. Uh, I should mention that Vern Dvorak's work has never been published. I mean, it's been published as a, a National Weather Service memorandum or like technical memorandum, but it never has appeared in the literature. And we don't know exactly how um, he arrived at some of what he did. It's still sort of a mystery to us. Um, <laughs> but, it, but it still works today. And what's key here is that we use it to estimate the intensity of tropical cyclones. And it's not a direct measurement, but we infer the intensity by looking uh, at cloud patterns. So you, you can think of it as a, a pattern recognition scheme. And these are the various patterns that we use. For the weaker storms, we use curved bands or shear patterns. And as the storm gets stronger, we start looking at embedded centers and CDOs. And for the more mature hurricanes, you notice that there are T numbers associated with, with all these various stages. And as we get toward higher T numbers or the more mature storms, uh, we start looking at, we can measure the eye temperature um, in, in, uh, with regard to uh, uh, the surrounding cold uh, tops of the convection. And that gives us some measure of exactly how strong the, uh, the storm is. This method can be used both in infrared and visible imagery. <clears throat> we also have, in a, this is a subjective method, and analyst is doing this. He's following a hierarchy of rules um, uh, to arrive at a, a final T number. But we also have automated versions, which you see here below. We've had these working for several years now, but they're not quite up to speed. Um, and so we're not ready to use these and have this replace the analyst. And that may not occur right away anyways. Yes? How come the uh, TPC doesn't issue the T numbers? For example, like I, I used to do international forecasts and ship routing, and, and uh, Typhoon Morning Center does, but TPC doesn't. Just curious as to that. Um, <clears throat> I'm not exactly sure of the rationale either. I, I know that if, if you're interested in getting SAB's classification, you can find that on the NEDSIS site. Right. Um, and that's updated very, uh, very quickly after um, they finish uh, uh, classifying the system. There has been some talk, I know, internally about releasing that, and I, I, I think that it's going to happen in the next few years. I, I really don't know the reason exactly, but it's more administrative than anything else. Yes? Um, what's the difference of that? I think it's called the advanced Dvorak technique that's the University of Wisconsin. Right, well, uh, well the, the, there's the ADT, which is the automated uh, Dvorak technique, but there's the ODT also, which is the objective method. And all that's doing is generally looking, first of all, it, it, it tries to pinpoint the center and then it's taking some measure of the cloud top temperatures within, say, a degree or two of the center. <coughs> and so this, this works best for the stronger storms, as you might imagine. But for the weaker ones, there are some problems. And that's why we've tried away from making it fully operational. And we're not going to do that until we work those bugs out, if, if, if that happens at all. There is a related technique I'll mention uh, for hybrid storms, uh, which we can use and we do use. Um, this shows the typical cloud patterns associated with uh, two classic hurricanes, Katrina and Rita. Um, you can liken um, the development that we see here as uh, is analogous to the evolution of, say, a tadpole from tadpole to frog. Um, so in the early stages, we start off with Katrina and Rita, um, very formative, um, amorphous shapes, maybe some minor banding features, and the center is not located in the center of the convection in most cases. Um, so at this point, we might call this a 1.5, a T1.5. And as we uh, go further along, this is about a day later, and the systems are following this standard rate of development of about a T number per day. Uh, we see two systems which are now minimal storms. The banding features have increased. The centers are more centralized within the deep convection. Down here at the lower left, uh, we have two systems approaching hurricane intensity, and I think you can tell that there's been further development. Uh, off to the right, Rita actually begins to develop much more quickly than the standard rate. Uh, Katrina actually is much closer to the standard rate, and because of that, um, it violates some of the rules. And th we do see this, th this is a problem with the Dvorak technique. It doesn't handle uh, the rapid intensifiers or weakeners quite so well. And um, there are some ways that we can handle that internally, but uh, that, that, does, that is a problem. Um, and you, you can see with both Katrina and, uh, and Rita that they continue to uh, develop until they become very mature hurricanes, uh, at least T7. Maybe I think Rita was actually a T8, which is the highest that we can get uh, on the scale. 
Now the Dvorak method, it's, it's, um, it's tried and true, as I indicated. We can use it on any tropical cyclone in any basin, and it's very, very accurate. Of course, um, how accurate the estimate of intensity is depends on both the analyst and, and his or her experience. And so um, there is quite a bit of training that takes place at the Hurricane Center with regard uh, to the Dvorak technique. And we use these uh, estimates. We still use a, a regular map, actually, at the Hurricane Center to, to plot um, all the position estimates that are given to us by the various satellite agencies. This is an example of an East Pacific storm. And you notice here early on, the fixes are all over the place. Quite a bit of scatter, uh, but this is where the track was determined to be, somewhere in here, well away from where some of the position estimates were. But you notice as it becomes better defined um, that the position estimates line up closer to where we think the track was. And uh, in addition to this, we, we are including uh, microwave, uh, microwave fixes. So we plot them as they come in. So we have Dvorak classifications for TAP-B. We used to have Air Force Global, but no longer. SAB up there at the top, we have an answer E image. That's one of the microwave images. And uh, the best track position is ultimately determined where it is at synoptic time. So as you can imagine, for systems that remain well out over the open ocean, this is Hurricane Gordon of 2006. This track is never impacting land. Uh, if you look at the post-storm analysis of its intensity, um, we're primarily dealing with uh, satellite classifications. That's, that's all that we use. But for a system like Hurricane Dean uh, that occurred in 2007, early on that is the case. We're relying primarily on satellite classifications. And you can see, at least up until about August 16th or 17th, uh, that uh, in terms of estimating it, its intensity, there's a heavy reliance on the Dvorak method. But after that, when it gets into the western part of the basin, we not only have Air Force Reconnaissance, but we have radar, and we have a, a number of other <coughs> observational platforms at our disposal. So again, no threat to land at the top, but then when it is a threat to land, we have much more data. Um, uh, in addition to the geostationary satellites, we have the polar orbiters. They generally uh, fly at an altitude of three to 800 uh, miles above the Earth's surface. And because they are located closer to the Earth's surface than, say, a geostationary satellite, they have higher uh, resolution. Um, but at most, we'll get two passes a day. So that is a main limit limitation uh, of this type of satellite imagery. Um, they fly from pole to pole, and that's how they get their name. Um, I mentioned the high spatial re resolution. And on board, they have special microwave imagers and sounders. These are the typical paths that they take. Um, and because of their orbits around the Earth, or, um, uh, there, can, there can be large gaps. And these gaps are largest over the tropics. And they can approach um, a distance of up to 1,000 uh, kilometers. Well, I wanted to give you a, a flavor for, for exactly how important some of, the, some of this microwave imagery is. The microwave <coughs> imagers provide images such as the two here below. I'll talk about this in a moment. But here is what we uh, traditionally use at the Hurricane Center. This is an infrared image of a tropical cyclone in the Western Caribbean Sea. And we're using a special color enhancement on it, um, hopefully to uh, elucidate where the center is. Um, it's not very clear from this necessarily. We can use some of the banding features to sort of trace in where the center is. And it might be somewhere in here. Um, for some of the weaker storms or the sheared storms, we use uh, what is called a nighttime visible image. And we're able to pick out low clouds uh, much more readily this way. Uh, that oftentimes gives clues as to where the center is. But I would say that in this case, it's not so clear cut. But uh, we fortuitously had a pass of one of the microwave uh, imagers. And I think this is a trim here. And I'm not sure about this one. But in any event, uh, you can see that there's an eye type feature forming. Uh, so where we can't see through the clouds here, we can. Um, it's very easy to, to locate the, the center of the storm. It depicts the eye type feature. And this often con oftentimes come in very, comes in very handy. And then we turn to radar. 